the living water is here at Christ Church in our worship and in all the things we're doing as a community. I'm so delighted that uh, Pastor Rainier is here to uh, lead another worship service in Spanish. Uh, there's also um, more information about uh, his background in ministry in the front cover of your bulletin. Uh, there's also a, a number of uh, important announcements in the back about uh, hurricane, um, earthquake relief, disaster fund, Habitat for Humanity, and a, a shoe ministry called Soul for Souls, and I invite you to read that as you're able to. Uh, as we come to the time of our scripture and our message uh, in the parables of Jesus, uh, turn our attention to the book of Luke, chapter 18. Uh, last week we're in chapter 15 with the lost sheep and the lost coin, and uh, the parable for today is about a persistent widow. Here's what it says. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There is uh, one of my faith heroes, his uh, name is E. Stanley Jones, a great uh, Methodist missionary to India, and he had a lot to say uh, about prayer, was an incredible leader, he knew Mahatma Gandhi, um, and uh, here's what he says in his uh, little booklet uh, called Pr How to Pray, it looks like this, he says, for men of all ages have instinctively felt that prayer is the distilled essence of religion. If we know how to pray, we know how to be religious. If not then, religion is a closed book. Where there is no effective prayer life, the heart of religion has ceased to beat and religion becomes a dead body of forms and customs and dogmas. If I were to put my finger on the greatest lack in American Christianity, I would unhesitatingly point to the need for an effective prayer life among laity and ministers. Prayer, it's not optional. It's an essential in the Christian life, both for laity as well as for clergy, and I think this is the point that Jesus is trying to get across to us here in this parable. I'm so grateful for uh, Luke in this version. In this very first verse, he, he tells us what the parable is meant to mean, uh, and then shares the parable. So we know up front where we're headed, and where we're headed uh, is that Jesus wants us to persevere in prayer. The metaphor for this message is that of a widow and a judge. Why a widow? In the time and the setting, widows were pretty much powerless. They ultimately had no recourse for uh, financial, for even uh, legal matters. Um, and they had to rely on God in their desperation. And it led typically to a pretty strong prayer life. In Israel, widows, orphans, and foreigners are special because of their vulnerability. And here, Jesus is lifting up the widow as an exemplar 
of someone who knows what an effective prayer life is and is all about. We heard from one widow already in the Gospel of Luke back in chapter 2, right around the birth narratives of Jesus. You may recall Anna in the temple. She was a widow. It says in verses 36 to 38 of the second chapter, there was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher, She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. My great-grandmother was a widow like that. She lived to be 101. Uh, I think probably the last 60 of them was as a widow, and I knew her for her last 30 She had an education level up to about eighth grade, and yet she was treasurer for her church for 20 years and read through the Bible cover to cover at least three times. And she prayed for me every day up until the day she passed when I was around 30. And in those days, she had trouble seeing and hearing, but her mind was still very sharp. And her spirit was very strong in the Lord and her mind in the scriptures. And she could pray. And so praying, she did. And I know her prayers mattered. And I trusted in them. And I still do. The prayers of widows, especially desperate widows with no other recourse, are a powerful thing. And I believe Jesus wants us to pray like such as these widows pray, for the Lord inclines his ear uh, to those who uh, seek him with such uh, passion, intensity, and at times desperation, and lifts them up as the model for all of his disciples whom he's talking to in this moment. This widow in the parable was persistent against this judge who would not give her justice or allow her uh, court appearance. She had this attitude of push. Pray until something happens. Come to it again and again and again. It says she kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. Doesn't say how many times she came back. It just says she kept coming back and we can gather. That's a lot of times in a row. The verb for kept coming is erkamai and it's in an imperfect verb form which means a repeated or customary action, a regular thing. Maybe as if a certain time every day she may have said it's time to go see the judge. And on the judge's end, probably when that time of day came around, he said, oh, here she comes again. She had dedication and determination for placing her plea before the judge and determination for what that plea would bring, that is, justice against her adversary. The degree of her desperation was matched by her determination. And Jesus offers us this image of the kind of determination that his people and his followers are to have when it comes to prayer. How many times are we willing to place the same need before God in prayer? It may depend on how dedicated and determined or maybe even how desperate we are, I suppose. This was not a good judge. It says twice that he didn't fear God and he didn't care what people thought. We're not sure why he kept delaying this case and hearing this woman's case, but he did. We might suspect that he was holding out for a bribe and here was a widow who had no such money for a bribe. It's a negative picture of this judge, not a good judge. But the meaning of the parable, I think, is what if we, with the kind of tenacity and persistence that the widow had towards this not good judge, what if we took our pleas and our petitions to God whom we know to be a good 
all-powerful, all-loving Heavenly Father who actually wants to hear from his children. In his book, The Circle Maker, uh, author and pastor Mark Batterson writes, Most of us don't get what we want because we quit praying. We give up too easily. We give up too soon. We quit praying right before the miracle happens. Persistence is the magic bullet. The only way you can fail is if you stop praying. 100% of the prayers I don't pray won't get answered. That's the one thing that we can really uh, count on. I think this is one of the uh, better, more recent books on prayer, The Circle Maker. It uses the metaphor of circling the areas of our lives, uh, our dreams, the people we care about, the situations, and to bring them to God in prayer with lots of scriptures and examples of persons in prayer throughout. Now the book next to it is Draw the Circle, and I think I even recommend this one more uh, because it provides scripture verses and reflections for each of a 40-day prayer challenge as well as questions to lead the reader through in writing and drawing their own prayers as they go every day for 40 days. I don't know how many times the widow came to the judge, but I think it was probably at least 40. And that's not a bad uh, start. And I've done this book and filled it up, and I'm seriously thinking about getting another one. Uh, the widow uh, also didn't take it to the enemy. So she had an adversary, and um, she recognized a higher authority when she saw one. She went to the power that was above uh, the adversary that she was facing, and she didn't just give up or lay down or resign herself to a situation. She pursued justice and a higher authority because prayer changes things. Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see she gets justice. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him night and day? This is an argument from lesser to greater. If even a bad judge will do this, how much more will our Heavenly Father who loves us listen to us and respond to us and bless us with what is just and good and right. We don't always know what is just and good is right, but we trust that God does. And we can bring it to him again and again and again and not knowing fully what God is going to do or is doing, but we know that he wants us to come and bring it to him again and again and again. E. Stanley Jones uh, says this about uh, prayer and its ability to create change. The universe is not a closed system, totally fixed by natural law, but an open system of possibilities, open to initiative and creative faith. Some things are contingent upon the human will and will to pray and cooperate with God in freedom and possibility. We don't know what those possibilities will be or what God is going to do or what the answer will be. But the only way to find out is to pray them. And the answer can be yes. The answer may be no. The answer may be wait. God can change the situation in the exact way that we're praying for. God can change the situation in a way that we're not praying for, but we would if we knew more than we did. God can be more, God can have more things going on in a situation than we even uh, know about to pray for. And in the midst of all of this, in a life of prayer, God can change us in how we even approach the situation. There may be a soul and character work that's going on in the people of God where God is as much concerned about who we're becoming as to what we do or what else is done elsewhere that we're placing before him. And while we're praying and waiting there, there are 
all these other things going on and variables involved than we can possibly realize. And yet, we know and trust that he cares for all of the people and situations uh, that we pray for even more than we do and honors the persistent prayers of his people that align with his greatest and highest good. E. Stanley Jones has said, God does not just want to answer your prayer. He wants to make you part of God training. He may have to say a lesser no in order to say a higher yes. Some have pitted against uh, the expression, my thoughts and prayers are with you, versus having some kind of responsible action that might make a practical difference. And I don't see them as kind of one or the other. It can actually be both. Um, in E. Stanley Jones's prayer life, uh, I believe he was nudged in these listening and follow sessions we call a quiet time or a devotional time. And in that time, he found himself praying for his friend Mahatma Gandhi who was fasting, and the, they were fearing that he was approaching death, and he prayed to God that Gandhi would not die. But he, out of, not um, in spite of his prayer life, but because of it, he felt led to wire the president and ask the president to intervene. And he did. And Gandhi uh, survived because of prayer, not in spite of it. Praying like the desperate widow means being bold and persistent in our petitions and pleas. It means when everything in our lives seems to be flying apart, we go to the one who holds all things together, as it says here in Colossians 1.17. The widow represents God's people who choose to pray and remain in him, according to verse 7, crying out to God, Night and day. Night and day. This was the pattern of Anna in the temple mentioned earlier. It's also here in 1 Timothy 5.5 5, where the Apostle Paul writes, The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. This idea of night and day, of constant prayerful relationship with God, appears in several other places in the Bible as well. Morning prayers can be a great time to have a devotional time, and evening prayers at the end of the day uh, can be a good time of reflection and see what God did in and through all of the situations you faced. And in between, there's this living in a Holy Spirit awareness to best serve the interests of the kingdom whatever may come our way. In my uh, devotional times, every morning I go to uh, Seedbed's daily text and find in there very good insights as well as an opportunity to take in God's word and, um, uh, and to pray. Some of them have led me to the place where it's not just having a prayer life, but having a life of prayer where your whole life is an expression of that prayer. And lately, um, what has struck me is a, the pattern of not just believing and behaving, but beholding God and becoming more godly by grace. Instead of believing and behaving, beholding and becoming I think a lot of times we come to God in prayer first with our request and we don't do enough beholding of relating to God, acknowledging God's goodness and grace first in this relationship. There's a, there's a song called Worthy of It All and um, I'm grateful that C.C. Uh, Winans picked, picked this one up recently in her new album, Believe For It. And um, like GT said, some of these songs are really repetitive, but maybe they should be for it to really sink into our minds 
as well as our spirits. And the really repetitive words are, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you all are th- for from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Again and again and again. The f- just repeated again and again and again. And it's coming straight from this verse right here on the screen. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And then it goes to a very repetitive bridge where first you have the beholding, and then it leads to the prayers and the intercession. And the bridge is simply this. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. This is the image from Revelation that the prayers of the people are pleasing to God and they rise up to God in heaven as incense rises. And they are felt and they are heard, and they're responded to. And so, uh, by faith in this, not a prayer life, but a life of prayer, of constant communion with God, we remember that he, he He is worthy of it all, that from Him are all things, to Him are all things, and so He is that higher authority that we go to when we meet with resistance and hardship and when things are just too hard for us to accomplish and achieve on our own. Lastly, justice is coming and Christ is coming again. This is in verse 8b. This last verse reminds us of what came before this whole passage in Luke. And it is all about Jesus talking about the end times. He was talking about it because people kept asking him about it. When is the suffering going to end? When is the kingdom of God coming in its fullness? Where is it going to be? In this whole parable, Jesus shifts it to say, don't worry about when it is. Don't worry about where it's going to happen. Instead, focus on being ready and praying like a desperate widow. You're asking the wrong question, and Jesus leads him there. This is what uh, scholar Joel Green writes about it. Having begun with a question about the eschatological timetable from the Pharisees, Jesus has repeatedly and now finally insisted on changing the terms of the discussion and therefore of end-time speculation. The question is not when or where, But given the present activity of God and its promise, certain consummation, how will people respond? He would have us respond in prayer, persistent prayer. In this parable, assurance is given. There is no question that justice is going to come. The question is, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find people in persistent prayer? prayer? Will he find people in not just an occasional prayer, prayer life, but in a 24-7 life of prayer? It's not Jesus is coming back so everybody look busy. It's Jesus is coming back so everybody pray like a desperate widow, night and day, day and night. Let incense arise. Let our prayers in faith arise. If we have something to be desperate about today, I would suggest that we don't waste it. When everything is falling apart, we can go to that higher authority, to the one who holds all things together. Bring it to Jesus. Bring it to the throne of grace that welcomes us, that justice might come. There's a lot that's not right in our world because it's broken. And as Pastor Temple reminded me in his message this morning, some of our prayers don't go answered because we are in a spiritual battle. And prayer and scripture are our primary elements and resources to survive and push through. 
Jesus says justice is coming. It's going to come quickly. And so pray like a desperate widow. Let prayer be that sign of faith that he's looking for when he comes again and brings justice and the fulfillment of his kingdom in all of its fullness. Will he find us there? Let us pray for justice, both for our own and for all the brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world. There are terrible things happening to Christians in Afghanistan right now. Sandra Richter is a uh, author of one of the studies we've done, Epic of Eden, in one of her Facebook posts recently. Um, she lifted up Afghanistan saying, the consequences for those who don't embrace Sharia law are frightening at best. The Taliban has apparently already contacted leaders of the underground church, a church that had been thriving. We know where you are is the essence of the message. This is the moment when our brothers and sisters will answer for their faith at, at great peril and risk. And so we pray for our justice, but we pray for the whole body of Christ and intercede for them. Let all of our prayers arise like incense to the throne that we might persevere and struggle through. In our, in our chapel, which we use for prayer a lot of times, there's a passage painted on the wall from Romans 12 says rejoice in hope be patient in suffering persevere in prayer let it be so let us allow the teachings of Jesus to point us in that direction with hope, with patience, uh, with perseverance in prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, it was a great, great word.